Hello there. Welcome to this week's Data Radio Show. As you can probably hear, I've been a little bit under the weather this week with the flu. My throat's not playing ball. So I ask Sam to step in and do this week's episode. He sits down and has a chat with Tech Data's lead scientist, Shung Lan, who we've spoken to a couple of times before. He wanted to have a look really specifically into how we can use AI prompting to help us create our own content whether or not it's something like writing a blog post or a script or research papers and how using the right kind of prompt work we can get there in the end with the way that large language models are evolving. So I'm going to pass it over to Sam and Shung. Enjoy the rest of the episode. And today I'm joined by Shung Lan, data scientist and AI specialist from Tech Data Australia, based in Melbourne. Welcome, Shung. Thank you, Sam. Glad to be here. Today, we wanted to show how generative AI has the potential to change how you research and develop everything from discussion papers to scripts to ebooks and blog posts. Much like having a university intern at your disposal to perform research and help you develop business cases or put forward a point of view, large language models and GPT agents can be applied to sifting through information to discern patterns and speed up the time to insight and value. And I, I guess uh, to illustrate this particular um, point, uh, we have uh, our picture here of uh, an army of, of young interns that you bring into the office. You know, this these are the AI uh, chatbots and AI agents um, that you start to see and start to be utilized. Uh, to perform these research tasks. So um, both Watson X and ChatGPT or OpenAI have uh, different versions of these uh, interface windows that you can leverage to perform this task. Um, so in the example that we're going to talk about, it's actually from uh, uh, an event that there was that we wanted to set up a scenario where we'd send our interns off to this uh, festival, which happens to be called COGX Festival. It's uh, had 500 speakers. They've had three different summits at different times. There've been thousands of startups that have participated in it, and quite a large audience. It was held in London in September of this year. And um, Shug is going to uh, step us through the, the setup process that there was uh, around, okay, we're going to send this uh, young intern off to uh, COGX and come back to us with um, some insights or um, different ways of understanding what was going on there. So, so Sean, talk us through the process that you went through. Uh, this application we developed under a framework called RAG, which stands for Retrieval, Augmented, and Generative. So what that means, think about this uh, scenario. You ask a question about uh, COGX, and the first step is to retrieve uh, all the relevant information regarding COGX, which we call Retrieval. Then with uh, this relevant information plus your questions that is the augmented part so augment your questions the third part of the generative will be we take this augmented information go to a large language model then generate the response and for this use case we have three main components the first one will be the knowledge base which we um, basically go to this website a uh, youtube website have this all 90, 96 videos regarding um, the COGX and we have all the transcript as our uh, knowledge base. The second part will be this uh, retrieval part. It's like a data search engine to retrieve all this relevant data. The last part will be the large language model to generate the response. So what we are seeing here is um, we have this interface built on what's next assistant Then I ask a question. Um, do you know COGX? So now this chatbot will 
that so this is question is not specific regarding COGX video, it's just response based on is uh, already have knowledge. Then we ask a specific question, is any AI governance topic on COGX 2023? So here we'll do that retrieval augmented generative steps to have this response based on the data uh, we provided. And we can see here, um, this is a response. And at the, at the bottom, we show that this response is um, based on this video. The video, as you can see, is uh, AI is coming and we are not prepared. So this is uh, um, how we build this application to answer the user questions, but with a specific knowledge base. Marvelous. Uh, I guess one of the things that um, comes up uh, in discussions around the use of generative AI is this uh, question of hallucinations. You know, talk to us a little bit about how we balance so-called creative answers versus the accuracy of the answers that a uh, chatbot might actually uh, undertake. Yeah, so for, for hallucination is like, that mean the answer from this generative AI, it seems right, but it's not fact-based and, uh, or we call that wrong information. And, and Sam, you bring up a very a great point is that the, the creative answer uh, and this uh, accuracy. So that being like in different scenario, um, hallucination could be a advantage, like a features we want, or can be some uh, concern when people use that. Uh, for example, when we want to do the research assistant, we want our response is fact-based or we have something to reference to check the response. But if we do some art creation, we create a image or, or create a video, we want to create something new, right? It's like nothing have before. There we want the uh, large language to be more creative. So hallucination is kind of like a features we, we want to have. And in, in technical point, like we, we do have some configurations when we use this large language model to set how, how creative we want. We don't want any creative or we want it to be more creative. So that is something we can, we can, can control, uh, but based on different scenario, we need to find the, the good balance. Right. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's relevant in terms of how you pull something like uh, a research assistant together. And, yeah. you know, in this this particular example here, um, we've we've got the chatbot uh, or the context aware AI assistant that you saw earlier. And now I'm I'm starting to ask it questions as if it was an intern. So if I think about the process that I would go through getting someone else to attend COGX uh, and what would be the output that I would want from that. So in this particular example, I've asked it to create an outline uh, for a 3000 word report on the key information presented at COGX this year. And one of the things that's uh, striking about uh, the responses that we're getting from these AI assistants is they're very similar in nature to, to that which you would see from a 20 something, you know, fresh faced intern attending uh, uh, so an event like this. So it, it kind of lacks a little bit of context, but, you know, they're picking up the key points here. So in this outline, you can see that there are six different points uh, from AI and health to AI and society, future predictions, and, you know, risks associated with AI. These were all things that were discussed. And the next step that I would take with an intern who's come back to me with some sort of um, outline would be, okay, that outline looks pretty good. Now, can you expand upon that and write the first section being the introduction? And so that's what I've asked it to do. Uh, 
I've asked it to uh, expand upon uh, the answer that it first gave. Exactly how I might do that with uh, a regular intern. Uh, and it's coming back with some reasonably interesting insights in, in terms of uh, some of them are a little bit general. Some of them are a bit more specific. So, you know, the next thing I've asked it to do is, is write section two. And it's come back with, uh, you know, not really enough um, in terms of what it was that I was looking for. So I've asked it to expand upon that, that to 750 words. But interestingly enough, you know, it's saying, I'm sorry, but as an AI, I'm designed to provide concise responses. So I've asked it to expand upon it. And as I read through this, one of the things that stands out are ethical considerations in the development and deployment of AI, AI uh, and some of the risks that are associated with uh, the, the deployment of artificial intelligence. And so, I'm now probing for uh, examples. Were there any examples um, presented? And it's come back with, well, yes, it did in terms of film production. Um, so then I ask, you know, uh, did he share any insights on the cost of film production using AI? And you can see here that uh, with this example, Lionsgate blockbuster fail. Uh, so the name of the movie was, oh, I beg your pardon, the name of the movie was Fall, <laughs> um, where rather than reshooting uh, 30 lines, they removed mm -hmm. the swear words uh, and made a family friendly version uh, in less than a week. Now to, to reshoot something is quite a substantial cost if you've got any sense of, of filmmaking. So it's an example of how uh, if you're probing with the right questions with this AI research assistant, you're going to find what it is that you're looking for. But it's it's not the same as interrogating Google or asking Bing. You know, I guess one of the things that we've learned over time is yeah. how to ask questions of Google or Bing. And I guess, uh, Shung, from your experience, you know, what are you noticing in terms of the importance of asking the right probing questions and, and uh, interrogating? Yeah, uh, great, great question. And this demo, and this is, I think this is a great demo. The first point, like you said, when you expand 750 words, that one, uh, actually, it's a setup in the large language model. I want this large language model to be uh, precise and short in the response. That's good. Uh, it confirmed with you before it go to that expand. Yeah. And when this uh, prompt, uh, prompt, or we call that prompt engineering, or to ask better questions, that is like iteratively uh, processed. So when you start, maybe you you where start with uh, some question without enough context to give you the right answer. You kind of try that uh, many times. Every time you add more details or add more context for large language model to give you more relevant questions. So I think that uh, I like your analogy to like work with an intern, since I, I remember when I work as an intern. Um, uh, the the question or the requirement from uh, my like my manager the first time maybe not very clear and I take that and go back to work next time uh, when the manager see my work give more feedback right you, you should do this in this format not in um, you should do this with uh, this with more details expand this section A like you do in that demo so I think it's very similar to work as an intern and you iteratively interact with large language model with more detail and you will get better response. Yeah. <clears throat> I suppose one of the, the one of the interesting things about that is that the 
uh, process is much quicker than working with a human. Like if I was your manager, as you've just described, and I asked you to go away and research this, it would take you, you know, maybe a day or a couple of hours to figure it out, come back. You know, what, what we're seeing is that this is taking place in, in the speed of, uh, you know, seconds in terms of uh, being able to iterate and understand context better and effectively learn as it, as it goes. Which I, I guess brings us to the question around what are you seeing in terms of how long it takes to, first of all, build these models uh, and, and this demo. Talk to us a little bit about how long it took you to, to pull this together. Yeah, for this demo, uh, it takes us one, two days to, like, when you when I have the idea, then to search how to do it, then do the hands-on coding, then uh, have this as a demo. So that is, uh, I think, a significant improvement compared to uh, a few years ago. Uh, for example, a good ex uh, experience I have is to build a HR chatbot as a, uh, when I work with a consulting uh, company. So that is a proof of concept. We have uh, uh, four teammates, uh, like full, uh, full stack developer, data scientist, business analyst. And it takes around like 16 weeks to deliver that proof of concept. And that is also have like a lot of uh, limitation in the scope. Like you can only do uh, up to five uh, customer journeys and uh, each journey you only can answer like 20 or 30 questions. But if we we if I would do that today, I think we will maybe four weeks, and with the less uh, skill I will need, for example, the data science part, maybe we before we need four weeks for data scientists to train the classifier to find the right questions. For now, with large language model, that that is like the the uh, out of the box capability from large language model. It can identify, in theory, uh, many questions, and also to identify uh, how to navigate the conversation with customer. That is a uh, reduced time. Overall, I think of four weeks compared to the 16 weeks before we see a 75% reduction for this POC delivery. And for this use case, COGX, um, consider in reality, you send an inter to the meeting for three days, then come back, the yeah the time we spend and this uh, money we spend on this is significantly reduced yeah um yeah, it's it's quite difficult to quantify in terms of what's the actual cost of of sending somebody to a conference that you know might be around the corner or it might be on the other side of the world um but the the essential point here is that it uh took you roughly how long to to ingest the 96 videos oh yeah that is another good point so for that 96 video is in total 50 hours but when we use this uh, transcript it's like three minutes you have all this transcript in your knowledge database so the the process that you went through was to to ingest the transcripts from the videos and and yeah. roughly um, how long did it take for you to, to gather the transcripts, upload them, and uh, effectively build the model that you could actually uh, interrogate? That will be the half-day effort. So when to start and to the end, to have all this end-to-end -end application set up. Uh, and I guess that gives you a sense of just how things are changing. Uh, and yeah. what becomes possible from the point of view of conducting research and assisting you in, in creative uh, writing and, and creative endeavors, if you like. Yeah. And, and I guess what we're seeing with generative AI is that it, it, it really does change this process, much like, as we described before, uh, you know, we've become conditioned to interrogating Google or Bing in a certain way. And now we're seeing an evolution of a more intelligent way of sifting through information where the creature on the other side 
um, being the AI research assistant, uh, has a much greater level of understanding of the, or at least is mimicking the fact that it has a much greater level of understanding of the content. And as yeah. you were pointing out, it's learning each time you're asking it um, uh, another question or, or probing in a particular area. Yep. Right, that's the episode. Again, thanks to Sam and Shung for stepping in and getting this one in the bag for me. Uh, and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Tell everybody about the video. Let everybody know what's going on. Um, there was some really interesting stuff in there that I've made many notes about while I've been putting it all together. Until next week, make sure you have a fantastic time and may the force be with you.